All right, so this is a Q&A. It's pretty informal. Um, if nobody has questions, I guess I'll just start talking more. I'll just talk more <laughs> about any number of things. Uh, but so uh, happy to talk about anything. Talk, happy to talk about what we're doing at Quantsite. Happy to talk about Open Teams. Happy to talk about EPython. Happy to talk about the PyData ecosystem, NumFocus. Uh, I've been, uh, kind of my life has been a journey. Um, when I was young, starting SciPy, I loved doing open source development. I loved working with the community. I loved sharing code. I love having feedback on that code. I love the conversations. Um, but I also didn't know how I was going to pay for my kids. Uh, I had three kids already. I have six now. And they're more expensive now because they're in college. Uh, when they were younger, they were also expensive. But we could get by on 18000 a year uh, in Minnesota. Couldn't do that in Austin. <laughs> Did that in Rochester, Minnesota. In, uh, and I knew already at the time that by giving away software, I was going to make money. So I already had that, I have had that question the whole time. So a lot of people complain, they talk about today, oh, hey, we're not getting funded, I'm burned out, I don't, I don't, there's no money in, in open source. I'm like, yeah, that's, if you just, if you don't have a way, if you don't have a, a, a job, you don't have an agreement, if you don't have a way to get money, you might end up doing a lot of stuff that you don't get paid. Now, I've been really grateful that a lot of good things still happen if you don't get money, you do get, um, Communities, you get friends, you get the opportunity to kind of, you get the opportunities, you get the opportunities to go talk to people. So while, you know, NumPy hasn't directly made me anything. I haven't made any money directly off of NumPy. I wrote a book that raised, um, ended up selling 3,000 copies, so I guess $90,000 uh, from that book, roughly. And about uh, 60,000 of that went to fund a graduate student uh, of mine that he was my one PhD student that graduated. So. And then NumPy's also helped me get conversations. It's opened the door so I could go talk to people. But then talking to people means I have to sell them something else. Because <laughs> I can't sell them NumPy, they already have that. Um, but I can sell them training, I can sell them support, I can sell them new things, I can sell them new work. Um, so that's, a, that's, that's been a constant question of how do we actually help get, get the benefit of open source but also somehow connect and align incentives so that all the, the value that's captured from open source by others doesn't just only go to those people that build stuff on top. Because today, that's the situation. Today, what happens is Amazon makes a ton of money off of Linux and off of the open source. They do. They've, they've commercialized it. But a lot of other companies have, too. A lot, of, a lot of hedge funds, a lot of financial firms, a lot of people are making a lot of money using NumPy, using SciPy, using Pandas, using Jupyter. Very little of that comes back to support those projects. It's a major problem. It's actually it's, it's broken. Like It won't work that way. Uh, because ultimately, part of the challenge is this is a, this is a generational problem. Because whereas I could, you know, oh, the promise of doing this is great. I'm looking today going, can I tell somebody, go work on open source and hope that you might have, be able to support yourself? Uh, certainly it's difficult when venture funds are out there pulling people in and telling them, I'll give you all this money to work on a new thing. Uh, but yet open source is still the best way to produce infrastructure software. Uh, it's not the best way, I don't think, to produce um, products, like end user products. If you think about end user products and kind of the benefits, there's trade-offs for open source, what open source does well, what commercial products do well. And at Anaconda, I've had the chance to actually get in the bowels of both of that and understand those differences very well, the difference between how I'm gonna build a, an end user facing product. I don't really need a community of people and a community of voices telling me what the user experience should be. In fact, yeah, that's, that's the wrong thing. Um, you really want a, a product that solves a problem for somebody has to have some amount of uh, top-down design, at least product management, that then chooses what it should be and so that the user ends up with a thing that is not just the cacophony of features that they don't understand how to use. On the other hand, libraries and infrastructure definitely needs lots of eyeballs, lots of opinions, lots of people to make sure it supports all the different use cases and that's much better handled by open source. So my belief, I'm a big open source fan, but I love solutions as well. So I believe those solutions, the software built on open source, needs help. And that's what Open Teams is here to do. Open Teams is to help people that are building software to sell it, to, to, uh, are going to use open source as part of it. Those they need to get things out of open source. They need to be able to connect with those open source communities and talk to them more efficiently and fund them. And I think there's a very deep connection that can be made between people that need stuff to build. Uh, and right now we're starting with open source, but really all of software could be built, is going to be built this way. All of software is going to need to say, I got features here, I need, I need pieces in open source, I need things there. So we're trying to start the early stages of starting that, that, that ecosystem. So, e so that's Open Teams. This is one of the major things we spun out of Quantsite. It's our first spin out. Quantsite itself is an is a incubation firm. 
um, it's kind of taking when I uh, uh, left Anaconda, effectively uh, turned Anaconda over to Peter, <laughs> sort of, uh, and, 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 and the rest of the group there, uh, what I realized I wanted to do was help a lot of other people create these kind of scalable systems. I want to I help people build companies that are deeply connected to open source communities, but provide value to the, to the world. So that, that's kind of what venture firms do. They do it, but they do it in a way that's not as cognizant as o of open source as they should be. Like most venture firms, I've talked a lot now, because we have a, open, a Quantum Initiate as an open source venture fund. There's actually one other that calls themselves an open source venture fund, it's called OSS Capital. Then I've talked to a lot of other venture firms, and some of the most intelligent of them, they say, well, yeah, all software uses open source, so of course we understand, we, we worry about that too. I say, well, great, well, do you understand how to actually, you should probably be funding those open source communities, right? Maybe some of the carried interest you earn on those, on those companies you invest in, how about some of that comes back to support the communities that you need to thrive? Oh, that, that's what we do. So we have a venture fund that directly supports open source research as well. So that's the big picture. I, I, like I've got all these little things going, but it's to support an ecosystem and an open economy. But the direct things, so some of you might care about this. If you're a startup, if you want to create a startup, if you're thinking about creating a startup, you want to fund this, let's talk. I mean, this is early stages, so we're still trying to raise our first fund. We're, uh, we're, just, we're raising money from LPs to raise this fund, so we don't have all the money in the bank that we're trying to get, but we're working at it. Um, and we've already made some investments, so, uh, small early stage investments. But we can help talk about what it takes to build a company. And certainly happy to talk to you about that. Quantite Labs, again, one of the organizations funded by carried interest on the fund, but also funded by direct work, community work orders, we call them. This is contract work that actually funds open source. The purpose of this is really to say, we need a PyData core team. PyData is out there, but who's supporting Matplotlib, NumPy, SciPy? Uh, Anaconda has invested some resources in funding uh, Pandas and, and Scikit-Learn and several other projects, uh, but we need more. We need lots of people doing this. And so Quantsite Labs is, is an example. It's one of many research labs that should exist. I believe there should be a thousand of these labs existing all over, associated with all kinds of companies. So this is more of an example than intended to dominate the world, but we're, we're gonna build a 50, to 75 person team at Quantsite Labs to fund and work on open source. So, and to do that, we, we do what we have uh, done for 12 years, which is open source consulting. So kind of leveraging that network and knowing how to do open source consulting, that's what we do. But the goal is to do things like this initiative, ePython. So, all right, I'll, I, I, I prompted some questions. Hopefully you can then answer, you know, please answer. I'll, I'd love to be directed by you. So, Travis, suppose, you know, someone comes to you and says, I would like to get my company, like I know my company uses Python a lot, yeah. and I, I need to start building some compelling arguments to go to management and say, hey, we should contribute doing X. Right? Yeah. Like, what are the tips that you give to someone that wants to do that? Yeah, good question. Um, ultimately, it depends on how important Python is to their operations. Yeah. right? If, it, if Python's kind of an occasional thing, they use it a little bit, then it's really hard to make a compelling argument you should support it. Right, but if, they're, if it's actually critical to their workflow, everybody has a support, everybody knows that effectively when they've, when they've um, bought a vendor, when they've partnered with somebody and they're investing in that thing, it's kind of a double-edged sword because they're expecting certain things out of that, that, that capability. Everybody understands the, the, point, the, the point of maintenance and support on that thing. Like you have, yes, you got that for free, but who's supporting it? You got the capability for free, but you gotta support it somehow. How do you do that? Well, there's actually ways to do that. It's not just an amorphous math. There are people out there you can pay money to that will make sure that your needs and wants and desires and, effort and things you're expecting out of that platform, you can get delivered. So, so there's, a risk, there's a risk mitigation. And that's one avenue to take with, so with the C-level is they understand that notion. They understand, oh, yeah, I have this risk. Now, risk is one of those things. It's some people take the risk. We, we all do. Sometimes we go, yeah, that's a risk, but I'm going to take it. So, okay. But other times it's like, oh yeah, we just made commitments to these other people that we're gonna lose our shirt unless we have some way to back it. Mm -hmm. So that's one, risk mitigation. The other is just uh, cost savings. You know, hey, we have this initiative, we're gonna go build this thing. You know, if we built that thing using, if we just, open source could be tweaked a little bit, then we could build our thing on top and we could save millions of dollars. As opposed to taking the existing open source and then working around it and assuming what we have so it's like, you ha if you assume that the state of the world is what only what's there now, you end up building from there, you'll spend a lot more money than if you recognize the state of the world is malleable. You can actually efficiently fund open source communities 
to get pieces you need done. And now you don't have to maintain that. And then you, so you spend less money to build on top and then you also spend uh, less money maintaining in the future. Uh, but that requires some guidance, right? Like somebody has to do the work to figure out where that correct, um, <clears throat> what that correct framing is, what the correct way to organize your software to do that is. And Quantsight can do that for the PyData stack. Now, if you're building on top of um, another stack, you know, Quantsight may not be the right place to do that, but there are other organizations that can do that, that can help you understand how to help the open source grow while saving yourself money. So, so basically, so there's risk mitigation, there's basic ROI, save cost savings, you're gonna save money. Um, I think the other thing is just features. You know, then the other thing is, hey, we could make money, sell, we could improve our customer experience and sell more of whatever we're selling if we had more features. And these features can come pretty cheaply by supporting open source in these ways. Does that make sense? It, it makes sense. So you basically, those are, the, those are kind of the three major areas that most C-level people care about. Mm -hmm. And you can address all three of them, mm -hmm. and kind of what the story should be depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have some specific follow-ups. Yeah, go ahead. Hey. Okay. So, um, I would imagine some of these stories would change a lot depending on, for example, company size, right? Like, like if you're too small. Oh, correct. Like you're not. Hundred percent. Smaller companies big. struggle to. Com smaller companies take all kinds of risks and and, and just deal with it. Yeah. For example, and then if you're too big, and if you're too big, you probably just want to own your own desk. It's like, yeah, I can afford to just like own this thing completely in house and 100 percent own the desk. Yeah, I, I would actually say nobody's too big like that. I would say that's actually many people think that way, but they don't realize that they're they're not actually bigger than the world. Yeah. Like there is no company out there that's bigger than the open source community. Like there are they aren't, and and furthermore, no company. And the reason is not because of just size of people; it's about mind share. No, it's about mindshare. So a good example for you is Goldman Sachs. Like Goldman Sachs in the 70s and 80s built a better version of the PyData stack than existed. They built Slang SecDB. Beautiful system, actually. We, don't yet ha we haven't yet actually replicated all of what it does. It's a really nice system. And they were content because they had the best system in-house. Everybody used it. They, they used it internally. Nobody else had it. It was great. So fast forward 25 years now, people left there, said, hey, we need this capability started to, and then say, well, look around, I'm not gonna invent it all night, hey, we'll use Python. And so several investment banks went out and used Python to build essentially the equivalent. And then that, um, so all of a sudden, you know, four, 10 years later, 20, two decades later, Goldman Sachs is sitting there on this proprietary database that now they're trying to hire people. Nobody wants to learn their proprietary language. Nobody wants to learn that. So they can't get talent. Meanwhile, the markets were moved so that there's all kinds of people learning Python and learning that for the same kind of capabilities, and it becomes a point of, I, you know, even though they could own it in the past, they can't own the future. And so, and every company's like that, no matter who you are. I mean, Google, is, well, there's a reason Google took TensorFlow and made it open source. Like, they're actually trying to do a jujitsu move on you, right? I, I'm actually a little, uh, um, I don't like what they're doing. I, I mean, I think there's, I, I like Google, I like the technology, but I don't, I think the approach they're taking could use some work because they're effectively trying to own an open source community as opposed to, to and effectively they're creating an ecosystem, like a shelled, hey, we're gonna create a planet and here's our planet and it's, you look around, it's like a domed planet. As opposed to saying, oh, we're gonna make the world as it exists better and let it grow as far as it wants to go. So, you know, that, that's, it. that's uh, you, you can't actually do it. Even if you're, there, I, that's why I don't think there's anyone too big. Just, yeah, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, Google feels that way right now, actually. Yeah. I would make no comment to that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but this, this principle... That He's got a bigger company, company than me. Even if you're the entire sovereignty of China, and you're a quarter of the world population, guess what? There's still a ton of AI research happening outside the world, right? Yes. So that's, that's the general principle. Of Perfect. Of well spoken. Great job, Peter. Thank you. It's exactly what I wanted. And my last follow-up is, so if someone wants to go and just read, you know, like case... Oh, he's doing stories like that, like, like, you know, um, like the story about Goldman Sachs, right? Like it's a real world example that, that it brings a lot more through than abstract arguments, right? Mm -hmm. People. Uh, or attempts that people have made inside companies to see, like, here's the, like, I attempted to get, like, an accounting you know, value of 
we hired this person to work half their time in open source. And this is how much, we, you know, how many dollars or you know, whatever benefits we got out of that. Like actual stories of when those things happened. Where, where do we That's a great stuff? question. What, no, where are these stories? Yeah, is there a place you can go to gather these stories? Because I would say there, I don't know of a single place where you can go and look and find them. I mean, well, so you can Google. In my old age, I've come to think about scale. And um, I think at some point, um, as an open source community, we may need to, to just up level and just say, um, I mean, at, at the Numfocus Summit, I had this crazy idea that we actually need to have data scientists unionized. And part of your employment contract is a writer that says you'll get X number of um, conferences that you get to go to a year. And um, part of your part of your hiring fee, part of your professional fees, yeah. go to pay for open source sustainability for the tools that you want to use. Because you're not going to go freaking learn COBOL or SAS. Right? Yeah, it, it, and that kind of thing. That there's work to be done. Because with them, then it's the 0.1% rider on top of their hiring fees. They pay recruiters yeah. 20 points. Yep. Paying NumFolk is 0.1% is nothing. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, I would say, to the answer your question immediately, I don't think there is a great place for that. I think NumFocus could provide, I, I, think, I think there's an opportunity mm -hmm. to provide more of that information. That's one of the things we care about at Quantsite, providing those case studies, providing those use cases. We have to do a better job of it. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time we have those anecdotal conversations in person, right? But it's awesome to have them s s localized somewhere. It's a good suggestion. Part of the challenge is some of these conversations are hard to get permission. Like I can't, I, I can't really tell the story of Goldman Sachs and publicize it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right, have a recorded <laughs> broadcast, exactly. Well, they've told that story now too, right? So, yeah. and you know, if it's recorded on PyData, nobody will watch it. <laughs> <laughs> because there's so much good content. You know, who's gonna, who's gonna sign into this one little, you know, one little thing? Yeah, watch, this will be the one viral video now. <laughs> yeah. I just want to add a comment uh, to your question. I work with Travis at Quantsite, and we spend a lot of time talking to prospects and customers about could versus should. You can build this internally, should you? And, and that question is something we spend a lot of time on and talking about pros and cons, because uh, a lot of bit larger, more established, more conservative organizations, uh, they just, we always build it in-house. We always, you know, we just buy something that's a commercial product, and so now they're starting to ponder as they bring in more folks that want to use Python and open source products, they realize they're being forced to change, not by the organization, but by the talent that's coming up and what they need to provide to them. Yeah, so the, the, it's, it's, it's migrating. But there's a lot of those conversations to still have, mm -hmm. a lot of them. So, you know, happy to help. <laughs> Actually, I'd love to do it. If you want to, you know, happy to, that's what we do. That's what I do. I go and talk to people all the time about their, and then just really have a real honest conversation with them at the, at the C level about how do they, how does this help them? So, I know in the academic community, like our incentive to publish into open source is like from getting it published into journals. Right. And it's NumFocus that actually sponsors the Journal of Open yeah. Source Software. Yeah. And like I've started publishing in there. Because Excellent. Of, like, the incentive to be like, oh yeah, like now I can be published in this academic journal. And also the requirements is basically, this is my like short paragraph paper about this is what I want to do. The actual documentation, like we spend days writing documents. Exactly. Like, that's totally fine. It's totally fine. In fact, I really love that. We worked on that a while with the SciPy, getting SciPy published, the proceedings yeah. published, and JOSS is an outgrowth of that to a real formal journal yeah. that uh, several people took forward and farther. I think it's really important. Like yeah. understanding the current dr incentive drivers that exist, yeah. and instead of, you can, you can rail against them, right? You can, you can rail against the, email, the windmills. I like Don Quixote, the book too, but ultimately, you make change by, al by realigning. Like, okay, this is the state of the world. Let's see what we can do to take it where it is, put something in place that realigns incentives, then moves forward from here. Like, to me, that's what Open Teams is. Uh, we've got another project you'll hear us talk about a little bit called Faro SS. Faro SS is kind of a sister of Open Teams. You talked about uh, alignment. Like, one of the things we want to do about that Open Teams is also helping with is, is credit reputation. One of the challenges of open source right now is it's amorphous. People make contributions. And it's not just, the credit is not distributed equally. Like people do get credit. I get lots of credit for NumPy and SciPy. But there's a guy named Charles Harris who's been in the Python community, the NumPy community for 10 years, really involved, has kept it going. All during the time while I've been here and there and trying to make get funding for it and doing some work here and there, he's been there the whole time. Right, doesn't get as much credit. He doesn't really want, he doesn't, he's, not, he's not a public speaker, doesn't really like to get out in the public. Deserves a ton of credit, right? We don't, we don't it's not equally spread. 
I, I care about that a lot. So it's one of the reasons, and, and it's, it's an equivalent of academic credit, like reputation is important. I think that goes, because I mean, I work in the biotech industry, so mm -hmm. I feel like if companies want to get recognized from other companies sometimes, it's like beneficial to be in a journal like that to contribute to open source. It is. So how do we make open source something that's more, gives more credit? So if you look at Open Teams, it, its whole its goal on the developer side, it's got several goals there, but one is to help projects govern better. And, and one way they govern better is by actually assigning credit to the actual contributors. Like project governance has several roles. It's with direction of the code, direction of the community. Uh, but we want to help project organizers fulfill their governance goals, one of which is to assign credit and make sure credit gets, goes to where credit's due. Because um, that's not something you can automate. And I don't, it's not an automated tool. It's, you can do things to provide tools to help that, but ultimately someone's got to make a decision about, okay, where, who did this work? And, what, and was it valuable, right? Because that's the key part that isn't automatable yet. Uh, so that's one thing Open Teams does too. Uh, Fair OSS is about setting up a, a, a credit, like giving people credit for, for supporting open source. Like a place, uh, kind of it's a brand. And it's a long-term goal of mine. It's not actually an active thing right now. We're not out promoting it much. We'll see it here and there. Like Open Teams is going to be giving away shares in, in Faro SS. Uh, the purpose of Faro SS is to be a watchdog holding companies accountable for giving back to open source that they rely on. So it's basically a brand they can get, like lead certification, like organic certified, like um, a brand they can get for doing things like establishing revenue sharing agreements and equity sharing agreements. What I realized last year is that all I wanted when I wrote SciPy from businesses was some agreement that if they benefit from SciPy, that some of their benefit, some of their growth in their capitalization, some of the growth of their company, some of the revenue they earn would actually come back to the project. That's all I cared about. That's all I wanted. If, they would, if, they, if people did that, just to a tiny degree, actually the world would be a much better place. So, you know, but asking for donations is hard. Like you gotta have some, you gotta have some reason they do it. Well, there is a reason. There's kind of a reason people get involved with open source today is because of you. Currently, developers um, manifestly go to work for places that support open source more than places that don't. So a lot of companies have figured that out and they all are on the bandwagon of, oh yeah, we support open source because that's how they get hired the best talent. And they know that, yeah. So in order to license certain kinds of standards, in order to get access to certain kinds of definitions like yeah. that, you need to be a member yeah. of the consortium. In this case, it would just be 10,000 members, right? Yeah. A user consortium. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, consortiums are certainly a, me a mechanism as well. And, and I'm, I'm really advocating all of those mechanisms, right? I mean, I, I, I can't do them all, like, but I, I just want to try to encourage other people, like, hey, there's a lot we can do. And I think that's, that's fair. In fact, I, Fernando Perez has a great statement. He calls it the funding fabric. That's the way I look at this, too. It's not going to be one thing that dominates and wins. It's, in fact, there's a funding fabric in lots of ways. Because open source is, frankly, massive. That's what surprised me, actually, doing some market research for open teams, realizing, oh, my goodness, you know, depending on who you look at, it's either 97% or 99%. Let's say 99% of software already uses open source. So this is a problem you don't know you have. I mean, it, what's one of the marketing terms we tell companies as well? Look, we're helping you solve the biggest problem you didn't know you had, which is you're totally relying on open source and you're totally not taking care of it. <laughs> you're totally not doing anything to support it. So guess what? Those wins can change. All of a sudden, you're using NumPy today and you know a couple things happen and pretty soon everybody's over on PyTorch and your code base is stuck over here in the past and you have no way forward. And you could have avoided that by actually having a relationship with the community to help them and help, help them help you. So that's... These are real problems that exist, and they're going to start biting people. What I'm trying to avoid, I don't want to have that happen be, oh, open source sucks. We should never do open source. I think, fortunately, that's, we're past that. You know, that's something that could have happened 10 years ago, but we're past that. Because it's, it's, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. There's no way you're going to go, oh, I, but they could say I shouldn't use that project, maybe. And that's what it'll be. 97%, 99% use open source. 57%, like, so I think that's too much, that's too much precision. Let's say 60%, 60, half, let's say half. Half of the code out there is open source already. 
What should it be? It won't be 100%. There are advocates out there who say all code should be open source. I'm not one of them. I actually think that's naive and doesn't recognize the, prob the, the issue that software solves pain points. And there are pain points out there that it's best to actually use proprietary software to solve. That a community is not going to support, you're not going to be able to create open source, there's no value in the open source ecosystem of making it open source. That's an argument I have with people. Some people are, you know, all open source, all software should be open source. I'm not one of those people. But I think 75% probably more than 50%, probably more like 75, maybe it's even 80, that order will be open source. And just that, that little thin layer on top, like the atmosphere keeps the earth, you know, uh, we can all live here, it's a tiny little thin layer. There'll be a thin layer of proprietary software that ensures the open source ecosystem can thrive. And the goal is just to make that feedback tunnel so the proprietary software using open source actually formally connects back to support the open source ecosystem. That's the work we still have to do. That is not out there. Currently we have effectively a exploitation device. A lot of people can build proprietary software. It's hard to do that. One thing to keep in mind though, as you're thinking about that, it's not a ton of percent. Like having built a company, realizing how expensive it is just to get a product off the ground and hired and, buy, and, and then the sales and marketing team, the effort around it. Like if you can get one, two percent of the uh, m you know, money back to open source, that's the goal. It's not 10, it's not 20, it's not 50. It's like, if you can get, the, the, my thinking is like, Honestly, if it was half a percent, half a percent would do everything. And it's, and it's totally doable. It's totally doable. Just a matter of, yeah, there's hiring dollars that are being spent that we spent more efficiently. There's marketing dollars being spent that we spent more efficiency, efficiently. There's, there's uh, software dollars that are being spent on, expensive, on, on writing that proprietary software that we spent more efficiently. So there's the market opportunity. We just have to go find out how to, how to capture that and pull it back towards open source software. That's the mission I'm, that's the real, that's the mission I'm on now, is how do we do that? And to do that, we, you know, I still, we still have ideas for initiatives. We have things we're trying to produce. ePython's just one of them. We've got a high-level data site. We've got a company called OpenTensors. It's just a, there won't be a package called OpenTensors. There'll be a concept. The concept is we have to build high-level APIs for data frames, uh, arrays, and data types. Right now, there's data, data frames are everywhere, and they're exploding. And people are using them to build libraries on top, but which library do you use? use which API do you use? Uh, if I'm using NumPy, do I use the whole NumPy API, or what is the API I can use that allows me to write tools like SciPy, Scikit, Learn on top, but let the implementation of the array migrate to GPUs, to other kinds of runtime features? That doesn't exist right now, and it's and it's a problem. We, we that's another area, that's another big important problem we have to fix. So there's lots to do, but we got to get funding to do it, and there's ways to get that funding. Yeah. Good question. I mean, at the end of the day, the first order bit is to solve your problem, right? And that's everybody, it's true for everybody. It's like Maslow's hierarchy, Maslow's law, the hierarchy of needs. You've got to solve your problem. And TensorFlow solves a problem, so people use it. I think the second order bit is, is solve my future problem, right? Solve a problem that doesn't, don't dig a hole while I'm solving my problem. So on that second order is where you can look, is where I look and say, hey, th you're solving this problem, but you're doing it in a way that's actually digging a hole and not helping this broader problem. I think what you do is you use alternatives. <laughs> you go, okay, actually PyTorch solves this problem too and is a, is a bit more community oriented and you tell Google why. Um, now, I will say TensorFlow has a community around the core that's actually a reasonable open source community. Like they are doing a good job of creating community around their core. Just the core itself is, um, there's, there's challenges with, how, with, how, with, with building that. That's a big problem and they're doing a lot of great work. So I'm not, I'm not here to bash Google, right? I, I would actually say thank you, Google, right? Is my, be my, my, my big message because they're doing a lot of good work. As a follow-up, do you have an example of maybe one of the big four that has open source something that you thought of that's been very successful um, or something that you really enjoy the, the way that they've open sourced it, the way that they've done that? Because it seems like there's... I think, more appetite I, think, I think PyTorch is doing a good job, right? I think they're, but I also recognize the different business situation that Google has versus Facebook in their core. So I, I don't, um, but I do like their approach they're taking, which is much more, hey, come, anybody can contribute to PyTorch. They have an open Slack, cha Slack channel. I'm not saying that that's exactly the way to have an open channel, but it is open and anybody can join. Uh, people make contributions to, to, Facebook, to PyTorch. They, they're inclusive in that, in that contributions. You're not limited by to contribute to PyTorch based on where you work. It's just simply how much you know and can you have, can you spend the time. 
I like that. Um, I think the, the project Anaconda's put out, right? The way that Bokeh, Dask, you know, think about the way Dask emerged, right? Dask was company backed. Anaconda spent a lot of money building Dask, right? We got some funding from DARPA to do it. We spent a lot of money internally to building Dask. Uh, spot, you know, paying for people, uh, giving people jobs, talking about it at length. Then Dask was company backed, but then it became community led. And from the beginning, it was very much open. Hey, come contribute, come join. Anybody can become a member, anybody can contribute. Very open in its uh, uh, cooperation model. And then ultimately becoming an unfocused sponsored project when it got enough community that it could be more than just uh, Anaconda backing it. Um, so, but I also, there is room in the world for company-backed open source. There is, and I think we should, as a community, should be tolerant of company-backed open source and recognize, and really just help companies make the decision of why they should be company-backed and kind of, so TensorFlow is company-backed, which can have an impact. The challenge, there, the challenge with TensorFlow is they're coming into a world that already exists where there's already community-led ecosystems that they're intersecting with. Like, I wouldn't have any problem with TensorFlow if it was something entirely new. And there are things there that are entirely new, but if they were adapting to what was, was instead of replacing what is, I'd be more satisfied, more happy. But they're kind of coming in with a new array object, with a new concept of what a tensor means, an array, an ND array is. Like NumPy exists, uh, array objects have existed in Python, workflows, array workflows work, have existed in Python for many years, and we just need GPU support and automatic differentiation to do machine learning. Didn't need an entire new C++ infrastructure, right? That's, that's the, the, the challenge. So work with the community to modify the, the, the project to meet your needs. It actually has saved them a lot of money. <laughs> they spent a lot of money that they would, didn't really need to spend. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of what I mean. So, yeah. So for businesses that are more like uh, consultancies that are helping other companies build on top of uh, open source, yeah. you know, build custom software. Yeah. So Some software for them, but then under the terms that you could then bring that back uh, to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's where the rubber hits the road, and there's a lot of approaches to take there. Uh, it depends. Most are very willing to make sure that changes to the open source stay in open source. You typically have to be intentional to have the conversation with their procurement and legal department because their default agreements don't do that. So you basically, hey, can we modify this clause so it actually changes to the open source, go back to open source? Oh, yeah, that's fine. They don't mind. It's just they're not predisposed that way. So I think that's one great initiative is to, in fact, we should share legal documents, legal paragraphs to put to make sure your, your statement of work includes contribution back to open source. But they're appropriately concerned. They don't want all the stuff you're doing to be open source, and that's fine. You're not saying that all has to be. You're just saying the pieces you want. It's a really easy sell, actually, once they understand, oh, did you want to maintain this yourself? Like, these changes we made to NumPy, you wanted to fork that into a, your private repo you maintain yourself? <coughs> oh, no, 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 no. Oh, okay, well then this is, like you just help them understand the consequences of their decisions because they don't typically want that. So it's, it's it, it, 10 years ago, that was hard conversation. It's very easy today, I would say. Yeah. So we could talk about Mm. Rely on open source tools, but they're essentially idle projects. Mm. It's not clear what the project management and who owns the project. Right? So a lot of times it's academic folks. We put it on GitHub, we publish it, we're done with it. Everybody starts using it, and no there's no support for it. it. Yeah. Yeah, so I would say that's, that's exactly the risk you need to let people understand. Yeah. And then the solution is you can actually, that's what's one powerful opportunity for these research labs, consulting companies. Like what I'm doing at Quantsite, I feel can be replicated a thousand fold around the world. I don't think, and it's what we've been doing for a while. Uh, but you have, but, so, and for projects like that, I would say it's, they're, they're desperately needing that. <laughs> they need somebody to stand up and say, yes, this is a supported tool. So I think it's an opportunity, actually. I would look at that and say, hey, this is even better. Uh, the challenge with NumPy is actually not the, the un, there's people out there willing to support it. The challenge with NumPy is actually enough funding to really organize the governance so that agreements can happen. It's in it, and fortunately, the grant that Sloan gave has provided some of that so that it's been able to move forward a bit more. Um, Quantite Labs, we're funding people to work in that space so that the conversation can move forward. It's a different problem there, but that's a great opportunity. Let's talk, man. I can, we'll, we'll, let's help you set them up so you can actually support that. Uh, in, in a way that is honors the people that wrote the code and makes sure that anybody can come to the table. 
in a way that makes it community-led instead of company-backed. Yeah, I think part of that is like the academic reputation system, which is you don't get reputation for patchwork projects. Yeah. You get reputation for for writing it, for creating new. Yeah, I agree. That's a whole question about. It, it's also related to the funding. Like most grant problems today, is you cannot get a grant to maintain software. You can get a grant to write something new. But maintaining software is really difficult. And that, that needs to change somehow, or we need to at least create some mechanism so maintaining what exists can be written into grants. There's work ahead. Like, that's a, that's a lot of work. Yeah. I would say that I mean, there's a bit of a chicken egg problem. Like, if you're successful, in, for instance, in this uh, taking pile of, of, you know, science, academic abandonware and connecting it to, potentially abandonware, and connecting it to um, dollars to the industry, that's another funding source. And then citations don't I mean, at the end of the day, academia, for all their high-moving principles, they respond to dollars. Absolutely. And so, so rather than trying to solve how you get published, you just bring dollars in, you know, you get published. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. So I'll end, I know we're out of time, but uh, go and sign up on Open Teams. Help us build this community. Uh, it's easy to just connect your GitHub account or your GitLab account, either one, to your Open Teams identity, and just start sharing credit nominating people for what they did on the projects. If a project you're working on isn't there, get it signed up, get the project leaders on board. Right now, there's ability to give credit, assign credit, nominate people for what they've done, build your profile for, hey, I'm done open source like this. This is my point. I'm encouraging everybody to do that. It's a place, it's a place we look for at Quonsite, one of the managing partners. Open Teams is also getting more managing partners if you're an organization that wants to do work with open source, sign up. If you want to be able to fund projects you see on the platform, if you want to be able to produce an initiative, say, hey, I have an idea for something we ought to be doing, great. That's what we're running right now. Eunice is here. A lot of what we have to do still is self-driven. What, you can, do now, what you, can, you, you can do now is nominate people, create your organization, create your profile. We're adding tools to be able to create initiatives, modify initiatives, do voting, polling on the initiatives to connect with the projects to make sure that where the initiative is going has feedback from the community. It's one of the key challenges is how do you actually do work that isn't just people aren't building antibodies against, they're actually supportive of. Uh, at least to some degree. So, and that information needs to be out there. If you're a funder and somebody proposes something, you want to know, well, do people care about this? Have you, have you gotten information from the rest of the community about this? They want to know that. Well, how do you do that? So open teams can help generate that information for you to actually improve those quotes. Yep. Providing some detail about what you did. Right. Thank you for mentioning that. That's a huge deal, actually. It's valuable to you, right? Because that starts to build your personal reputation profile, because it shows up on your profile as well what, what things you use, uh, talking about you know, what are your technical skills, what technologies do you apply, and how have you applied them. Uh, it's a little bit more rich information than you find on, say, LinkedIn or yeah. yeah, how I use it. You don't have to have contributed to any of these projects, but if you use them, <laughs> let people know. That helps the maintainers, helps funders. Uh, the goal is to really create a rich fabric, a rich ecosystem that information can flow so these funding fabric, this funding ecosystem can also grow. Uh, along the lines, it already works. We don't have to reinvent many things, but just educate, tweak, help move things forward. All right, thanks. I'd love to talk about this stuff. Happy to talk anytime about funding and getting open source community. We have an open teams community. Its whole goal is to talk about funding and open source. So come be a part of the community here in Austin. It's a, it's a sister community to the PyData community. We're very, we work very closely with NumFocus. We love them. Um, so happy to keep talking about everything. Thanks.